Chief White House Correspondent Major Garrett joins us now from Washington. Major, Donald Trump tweeted just a short time ago, in fact, that he's actually postponing the meeting that he had planned with Benjamin Netanyahu in Israel until after, he says, until after he becomes the president. But, uh, you know, this also comes at the, at, just after Netanyahu rejected Trump's plan to impose a ban on Muslims entering the U.S. So you got to wonder if there's a connection with this cancellation of the meeting. We certainly have to wonder if there is a connection. There does seem to be a action by Netanyahu, a response by Trump. But let's remind ourselves, one of the things that happens with the Trump campaign is every day just seems so full of a new Trump pronouncement. We tend to forget or don't quite remember what's happened recently. And Trump has serious issues with Israel in this sense. He calls himself a friend of Benjamin Netanyahu, but just last week, not six months ago, just last week here in Washington, when Trump addressed the Republican Jewish coalition, he said the following, you're not going to take my money because you can't control me and you're all really great negotiators. You should like me drawing on Jewish stereotypes long since rendered irrelevant in American politics. Trump would not commit to having Jerusalem be the permanent capital of Israel. That drew boos from the crowd. And he didn't have any specific answers about the contours of negotiations with the Palestinians, other than to suggest Israel needs to give more. All of these things make Trump very difficult for Israel to deal with. There's a Republican Party in Israel with the American community there. And the leader of it said last week, even before this entire Muslim ban controversy, Trump shouldn't be president. So there are lots of reasons Trump has problems in Israel. I think this clash with Benton, Benjamin Netanyahu is one of them, but not the only one. And it's important to remember that. Uh, Major, you know, in your piece, you talked about the third party candidacy historically being not a path for victory for a candidate. But, you know, I, I couldn't help but be struck by the notion that I I is history really any guide when it comes to Donald Trump? Because the usual metrics just don't apply. Well, the usual metrics, you're right, Elaine, have not applied. All the forces of political physics that I've come to know, <laughs> gravity being one of them, you say <laughs> things that are completely outlandish or in the case this week, utterly unconstitutional and completely at odds and repellent to American values should bring you down the polls. That hasn't happened yet. On the third party question, though, historically, and that's all we really have to go on is the history of our country. We have had a lot of presidential elections, and every time someone runs as a third party alternative since the formation of the two major parties, Republican and Democrat, that has been a protest movement. That's what happened to Ross Perot in 1992. It's what happened to George Wallace in 1968 and Strom Thurmond in 1948. It's a path to defeat. What you can only hope for then is that one of the two major parties takes on your message. But if Trump runs as a third party alternative to the Republicans and Democrats on what is regarded as a xenophobic, minor league racist sort of platform, that is not going to be one embraced or later taken on by Republicans or Democrats. And Republicans will have made a decision that for the future of their own party, they're better off without Trump and Trump will be on the outside looking in. That doesn't mean he wouldn't collect votes, but it does mean he would never be president. Uh, speaking of a protest movement of sorts, you know, we're hearing more and more about Republicans organizing, raising money to somehow combat Trump. The Wall Street Journal uh, did an article about a guerrilla campaign with secret donors and a major Bush donor actually put a, a full page ad in a Miami newspaper calling Trump a uh, bullionaire. I'm wondering if you have ever seen this before. This is money that could be going towards backing a potential uh, candidate. And instead, it's money going towards trying to knock the front runner off. That's exactly right. And this really goes to what has become a conversation that is about the existential future of the Republican Party. What is it? What is it going to be? What issues will it defend? What orientation to the country and to governing will it project in this election? Trump raises all of those questions in ways Republicans feared he might when he got into this race in July and now have no option but to recognize he is. And the fate of the Republican Party, many Republicans I've talked to, is at stake. They believe. And what they're hoping and it is only a hope that something about Trump will finally push him over the cliff and that his campaign, once voting begins in Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina, all of this will go from an abstraction to a reality. Voters will reject this message from Trump and solve the problem for the Republican Party. But if that does not happen, Republicans are trying to figure out ways to stop him. But the fact of the matter is their options are limited. And 
Trump has plenty of money. Remember, he's at the top in the polls was spending nothing on his own campaign. He's invested nothing in yeah. campaign advertising, unlike Jeb Bush's super PAC, which is already laid out by estimates, $50 million, and Jeb Bush is in the low single digits. That's another historical first. I've never seen that much money spent to such little effect. All right, Major Garrett in Washington, thank you so much for your insight. Sure.